So uh, you get to hear from me a second time this afternoon. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to our, our final speaker of the day. Um, Judge Janice Rogers Brown uh, served on the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit uh, from 2005 to uh, what, 2012, that's right. Uh, tw sorry, 2017, sorry. Judge, I should know that. Um, and she served uh, prior to that uh, on the California Supreme Court. Um, now, for those of you uh, who are younger in this room and who think uh, Michael Dukakis was a, an Athenian general, um, <laughs> Judge Brown was on nearly every short list for the Supreme Court for years, and but for uh, two gentlemen by the name of uh, Joe Biden and Barack Obama, probably would have been seated on the Supreme Court under George W. Bush. I give that to you so that you can put into proper perspective um, the reputation and um, the, the, uh, the stature of who you're going to hear from. Um, Judge Brown has uh, had a, a very long and storied career in, in public life. Uh, she served as a legal advisor and counselor to then California Governor uh, Pete Wilson uh, prior to her, her appointment on the bench. Um, and she is a graduate of um, UCLA Law School. And I think for my pur uh, purposes, um, and I, I think you all will second this, uh, as a former clerk of the judge, she is probably one of the greatest teachers in the conservative movement. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I will give the lectern to her and please um, enjoy the opportunity to learn from one of the wisest voices we have on our side. Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you. That was such a lovely introduction. I think I should just leave now. <laughs> Quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I uh, thank all of you for being such an engaged audience, and uh, I thank Claremont for uh, inviting me to participate. Um, you have heard from uh, members of Congress, uh, former executive branch officials, and conservative thinkers, all the smart people. So I guess uh, I am, as a retired judge, here uh, to finish our discussion. And that's probably um, at least attributable to the widely held, but nonetheless incorrect view that the judiciary is the least dangerous branch. <laughs> what harm can I do batting cleanup, right? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start uh, with a little bit of what I have been feeling lately um, so forgive me for um, indulging my melancholy just a little bit. There was a time when the world was new. The new order for the ages eagerly awaited. Americans embraced their destiny, bringing light to a benighted world and thought of themselves as the almost chosen people. However, in the fullness of time, Civilizational confidence ebbed away, sapped by a series of heresies, half-truths, and abundance of hubris. What began as a sliding feeling, a slight disorientation, became a lurch and then a sickening, heart-stopping plunge. We fell like a meteor shower, our fading lights painting streaks on the walls of heaven as we hurtled into the dark. How we fell, how we went from being a city on a hill to no more than a faint luminescence at the bottom of the abyss is a stern cautionary tale. The men who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor were not naive. Uh, they may have understood human, more about human nature than most of today's neuroscientists. They feared factions. Uh, Madison rejected direct democracy. In Federalist 10, perhaps one of the most familiar of Publis's essays in support of the Constitution, he explains how he hoped to ameliorate the very real disadvantages of both. 
In a direct democracy, he noted, there is no cure for the mischiefs of faction, for there is nothing to check the inducement to sacrifice the weaker party. Thus, democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the right of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. That is why Madison attempted to build into the Constitution many checks and balances to prevent any one person or group or mob from gaining excessive power and inevitably abusing it. Caution was not exhausted in that first generation. Lincoln praised the American ideal of self-government as the last best hope of Earth. But he also understood the Republic's great vulnerability. In a prophetic speech at the Young Men's Lyceum uh, in 1837, he said that what no invading foeman could do, the silent artillery of time might accomplish. As a nation of free men, he said, we must live through all time or die by suicide. And the assault on American constitutionalism came despite the new birth of freedom obtained at great cost on the blood-drenched battlefields of the Civil War. The age of eternal verities was superseded by a plague of foreign-educated PhDs, contemptuous of ideas linked to traditional law and morality, the law of nature and nature's God, and enthralled to totalitarian secular ideologies and their promise of untrammeled power. <clears throat> It may be odd to think of the American regime as lawless. It is, as Marianne Glendon noted long ago, the most law-ridden country on the face of the earth. But even a nation awash in positive law can still be lawless if its political processes are corrupt. Its law gives broad discretion to discriminate, to apply laws selectively and unjustly, if the laws, no matter how many code books they fill, are ignored by those bound by campaign promises and solemn oaths to defend them. <clears throat> Alas, government is the only enterprise in the world which expands in size when its failures increase. Aaron Wildowski notes that the Madisonian world has gone topsy-turvy as factions defined as groups activated by some common interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community have been transformed into sectors of public policy. Indeed, says Wildowski, government now pays citizens to organize, lawyers to sue, and politicians to run for office. Soon enough, if current trends continue, government will become self-contained, generating apparently spontaneously the forces to which it responds. Now, Wildowski said that in the 1990s. Uh, so I uh, hope that this discussion can go on from there and can talk about um, something else. He explains how um, and maybe not why we're so comfortable with that result. Um, but the... General consensus, I think, from uh, most uh, legal commentators is that the Madisonian system has been undone by political ambition, popular democracy, and judicial fecklessness. Um, I will get to judicial fecklessness in a moment, but I just want to say um, that I'm not uh, particularly down on judges. Some of my best friends are judges. <laughs> uh, my point uh, that I hope to get to um, is that maybe we expect too much of them. Um, and that's a different problem altogether. Um, but the way we start down this road um, is because, as you heard in an earlier panel, of what people perceived as widespread abuse of political patronage, partisan collusion, and dishonest graft, courtesy of business political alliances involving railroads and manufacturing and agriculture, 
Um, and that provided much of the justification for the progressive movement um, of the early 20th century. Woodrow Wilson's anti-founding animus was apparent. He dismissed the Declaration of Independence as Fourth of July sentiments, basically. He had a very contemptuous attitude um, toward uh, the documents that we see as uh, critical underpinning of our regime. Um, he well understood the repudiation of that ideal of human equality was the death knell of limited government, and he applauded it. He was all in favor of that. Um, it was his insistence that um, disinterested administrators and a British-style parliament and a president elected by a popular majority and functioning like a prime minister was be the cure to corruption and would, quote, save democracy. As it turned out, enlarging and entrenching federal power was a prelude to worse and more intra intractable corruption in the future. But the court's uh, role in this dissolution is pretty easy to trace. Uh, in Seward Machine Company, the court decided that um, Congress's power to um, tax and spend um, was for the welfare of the country as a whole. In other words, taxing and spending for the general welfare um, was a plenary power, you would say, okay? Um, on the same day, it upheld the Social Security Old Age Insurance Program in Hel Helvering v. Davis. Um, and that decision was followed in short order by a case called United States v. Caroline Products, which all the lawyers in the room are familiar with, I'm sure. But that case invented rational basis review and basically said economic regulation was entitled to a strong presumption of constitutional validity. A couple of years later, they decided a case called Wickard v. Filburn, which gave a very expansive gloss to Congress's power uh, over interstate commerce. And that, Charles Murray contends, um, those decisions between 1937 and 1942 transform the nation. Um, and with the benefit of hindsight, it certainly looks that way, right? So President Roosevelt, uh, you know, who maybe intimidated the court, maybe not, <laughs> um, but he made an early appeal for the creation of, the, of a welfare state in an address to Congress in 1941. He's, among the four freedoms that he identified was freedom from fear and freedom from want. Freedom from fear is a rather nebulous and meaningless slogan. Uh, I don't think anybody's ever tried to figure out exactly what that meant. But freedom from want really meant not a freedom, but a right. And it was the right to the necessities of life at public expense. And that seemingly innocuous phrase, freedom from want, heralded a shift from negative rights, rights uh, which shielded people from arbitrary interference by government, to positive rights, government as a sword to ensure entitlements, a shift from limited to unlimited, indeed limitless government, and a massive shift of power from the people to the government. The philosophical justification for this accelerating process of redistribution is that government has the duty not only to alleviate the lot of the poor, but to abolish poverty itself. And that became, of course, the portfolio of the great society. And that we are no longer going to permit uh, anyone um, to um, live in poverty um, as the bureaucracy defines it. Abolishing poverty and inequality was the impetus um, for that effort, which has now cost trillions of dollars with, with very uh, little change in the level um, of poverty as defined by the bureaucrats, and with some untoward uh, consequences that maybe or maybe not were unintended, um, but certainly that nobody talked about at the time. Um, 
As a result, there are a lot of uh, legal commentators who now look at our political institutions um, as systematically, professionally, and irredeemably corrupt. Um, and that's because that's uh, not um, an unusual consequence of having uh, a huge source uh, of money. And what happened was that the uh, federal government became this gigantic siphon that pulled in uh, money and resources and re redistributed as franchises and uh, entitlements and um, you know grants and aid and all of these kinds of things. And that money was then used um, to basically buy compliance from states, uh, from other um, levels of government, um, and to allow the federal government to dictate um, the ways that things are, are done. So for instance, you could um, have a grant in aid for a bridge in Vermont, um, but uh, the bridge then, that money comes from a program to cure obesity in children. Well, what's a bridge in Vermont? <laughs> got to do with obesity in, in, uh, in, in uh, young people. Um, well, the idea being that, well, we, we need this bridge so that kids can uh, walk to school, and that will <laughs> uh, help with this problem of obesity in childhood, right? So that's the kinds of weird uh, combinations of things that you get. I mean, people are ingenious when it comes to spending other people's money. They can really, really figure out ways to do that. Um, so, and basically that worm that was planted in the 1920s and 30s, that potential of unlimited federal power, suddenly, and this is Chris DeMuth's words, crystallized in the 1970s, he says, in every corridor of government and politics, as Congress began commissioning fleets of regulatory agencies with unprecedented discretion and economy-wide power. The courts were quick to do their part, approving the delegation of congressional power to administrative agencies, permitting the combination of legislation, legislative, judicial, and enforcement powers, the very definition of tyranny within each agency, and creating tiers of deference to solidify their hegemony. Federal control of virtually unlimited funds led to other untoward consequences. So this first phase was the kleptocracy, uh, government um, being authorized um, to take other people's money for a whole variety of uh, programs and projects and, you know, and also uh, creating this very professionalized um, bureaucratic class, the managerial elite, as it were. But what comes after that um, is that now you have so many people doing so many things and there's so much duplication um, that uh, you end up with the kludgeocracy, okay? So <laughs> the kludgeocracy gets... Uh, piled on top of the kleptocracy. Um, unlimited government is bad. It's a slow motion catastrophe, but it turns out that, that government reimagined doesn't solve problems, it just adds to them. Kludge is a computer programming term, meaning a stopgap measure. Political scientist Steve Tellis borrows this term to convey the idea of America's increasingly complicated, indirect, and incoherent policy mechanisms. Now, TELUS uh, is not about limited government. Uh, he's on the other side, but I think his description of this is very accurate, because uh, what he would say is, uh, we, we get rid of the kludge by just admitting that we have uh, an unlimited government and embracing Leviathan, right? Um, he says we're in this problem because we're trying to disguise the fact um, that we have unlimited government and we're spending these huge amounts of money. Um, and and we, so we try to do it indirectly 
and uh, without people actually being able to trace uh, you know, where all this is going and what's happening. And he's probably right about that. Uh, but there are consequences to having unlimited government. So um, to recall um, one summary of this, progressives wanted politics to be more democratic, but also wanted government to be less political. Increased participation would mostly amount to democracy, democracy theater, but the sort of participation of, of that kind innervates self-government by making it seem that signing petitions and donating to lobbying groups has some meaningful impact on governance. In reality, it is the technocrats, the experts and advocates who move in and out of the public and private nonprofit sectors who are agile enough to negotiate the killer clutches or use the sclerotic pace induced by the proliferation of red tape and bureaucracy to the advantage of their cronies and their class. So we get declaring infrastructure, school boards that demonize concerned parents, public prosecutors who refuse to prosecute criminals, uh, and agencies determined to make an example of anyone who does not fall meekly into line. This may explain why the federal government, since the Great Society, uh, progressivism's grandchild, has grown into a leviathan both feckless and frightening that most ordinary Americans deem unworthy of trust. Perhaps predictably, the rule of the managerial elite has much in common with the vanguard of other totalitarian regimes. Truth is their enemy and fear is their weapon. If that is the Gnostic insight to be discerned by the enlightened elite as they nudge the flow of history, I would just as soon pass. As Bradley Watson notes, nowadays our progressive elite's fascination with identitarian politics doesn't leave much cultural space for the ordinary non-birthing person, <laughs> formerly <laughs> formerly known as the common man. Uh, but the growth of Levi Leviathan went right along with the rise of the imperial judiciary. Conservatives mounted a valiant effort to rein in living constitutionalists. And maybe they succeeded. At least Elena Kagan was willing to say in 2010, everyone is an originalist now. But, as Michael Ullman, a longtime fixture at Claremont, acknowledged in a Claremont review in uh, 2006, originalists successfully exposed the fragility of postmodernist constitutional constructs, but they were far less successful at reaffirming the extra textual, enduring, self evident truths that must undergird the case for limited government. Two decades into the originalist project, Yulman described a court that had, quote, rewritten inconvenient constitutional history to suit fashionable ideological preferences, conjured novel constitutional rights and theories out of thin air, uprooted many well-settled norms of American political culture, and all but decreed that the Constitution incorporates postmodern conceptions of moral autonomy. Indeed, he said, by reading their own predilections about autonomous individualism into both the free speech and religion clauses, Yulman said the court incentivized pornography while treating religion as a toxic presence in the public square. The list of innovations he finds irreconcilable with the founder's constitution is lengthy and damning. And I will say that the court in this past term uh, you know, did yeoman service. Uh, they were very courageous. Um, they were, um, they went as far as pure originalism is likely to take you. Um, and the reward that they got for that um, is more of um, the failure, right, to um, actually implement or uh, respond to violations of law because the reward that they got for that incredible term um, is that since the leak of the Dobbs opinion, they have basically been under house arrest, right? They've had to have uh, 
security because the administration has chosen not to um, prosecute people who are violating the law by demonstrating in front of their homes in order to intimidate them. Okay. So part of that problem that Yulman is talking about um, is that even once you get beyond the living constitution, you can reject that. Um, but what um, Harry Joffer says is uh, both the people who object to the um, living constitution, the advocates for, and the opponents of living constitutionalism were both followers of Holmes, right? So, in fact, they embrace this fact-value distinction, which is at the heart of progressive orthodoxy. This is the dogma that holds that all moral judgments are vulgar, are value judgments, and that there is no rational way of deciding among conflicting values. Um, so we have this problem Charles Kessler uh, cogently describes as you can have progressivism, um, how does it, progressivism fast forward or progressivism slow motion. You just have progressivism nevertheless, <laughs> okay? Um, and this makes it very hard to distinguish strict textual originalism from positivism. Uh, what Jaffa says is no one can at the same time be a legal positivist and an adherent to the original intentions of the framers. In asking what were the intentions of the founding fathers, we are asking what principles of moral and political philosophy guided them. The crisis of American constitutionalism, the crisis of the West, lies in precisely the denial that there are any such principles or truths. Okay? So... Finally, we've had kleptocracy and kludgeocracy, and so finally, demonocracy. <laughs> Rizard Legudo insists that there's a demon in democracy. He says, you don't have to be very acute to see a strong res resemblance between the communist activists on the one hand and the lim liberal democratic lumpen intellectual on the other. Right? There's a Marxist unity to their theory and practice. In other words, co the coercive utopia and the permissive cornucopia are mirror images. The brooding benevolence of the permissive cornucopia is only permissive to its favored victims. On those inclined to resist its coercive call to compassion, it will not hesitate to use the whip, to scourge with fire and sword, or its modern equivalents, the IRS and the FBI. Uh, in 2019, Zach Goldberg did a deep dive into the woke revolution that he said was transforming American uh, politics. And he concluded that the baseline attitudes expressed by white liberals on racial and social justice questions have become radically more liberal. And he suggested this revolution uh, in moral sentiment is what has led to the ideological stridency and intolerance of anyone or anything that stands in the way. Uh, this ongoing transformation is what Matthew Iglesias has described as the great awakening, and he has posited it has moved white liberals so far to the left on questions of race and racism that they now are to the left even of the typical black voter. So he says, so Goldberg says the woke elite act like white saviors, saviors who must lead the rest of the country, including the racial minorities whose interests they claim to represent to a vision of justice the less enlightened groups would not choose for themselves. I should pause here for an aside. Uh, one very respectable commentator has decried using the term woke because it says it makes these folks seem trendy and a little bit cuddly. Uh, he says, they should be called Marxist, pure and simple. There is some truth to his criticism, but I would say they are Marxist, corrupt, and complicated. In context, woke serves as well as any other appellation, and its religious connotation is useful. Okay? While Goldberg finds the liberals 
greater concern for the outgroups and even the world as a whole, globalism, praiseworthy, he admits a problem arises when these moral emotions become hyperactive, detached from objective reality, when they motivate the division of society into allies and enemies, and generate a level of sanctimonious outrage and judgment that places all political dissent beyond the pale. Now, I think his analysis is plausible and it's perhaps even comforting. And I think that's how we started out thinking about this. Um, but I think his explanation is far too benign. The totalitarian overreach of the woke mob is not an artifact of their overzealousness in doing good. It is a feature of their malevolent intent. This is not a noble idea that went wrong. Like communism and the radicalism of the 60s, these ideas were born wrong. In a book that's nearly two decades old now, Jean-Francois Ravel celebrated the world's apparent rejection of the utopian illusion, but warned that the false idol that has dominated the political culture of the left, the idea of revolution, had been repulsed, not vanquished. Ravel observed that the uprising of 1989, what Francis Fukuyama dubbed the end of history, was not the result of a romantic pursuit by elites of some utopian goal. It was the attempt of ordinary people to restore authentic democratic traditions subverted by political gangsters. Utopians, he reminds us, are shrewd seducers. They propose the opposite of what they are really aiming for. The tragedy is revolutionaries reproduce the very evils they say they will extirpate. And that, I believe, is why the revolution of 2020 looked so familiar. Antifa and BLM are the shock troops of a woke elite, the heirs of the radicals of 1968, who have won the culture war. We find ourselves once again facing marauding mobs who claim American society is irredeemably unjust and the American system must be utterly destroyed, burned to the ground, and rebuilt according to their revolutionary blueprint. And this time, America may lack the cultural stamina to resist. The cancel culture demands condemnation of white supremacists. Okay, but it is hard to see any qualitative difference between white supremacists and woke supremacists. They both claim superiority to certain despised groups. Both contend it is appropriate to treat members of such groups with contempt. And in both cases, the point of the exercise is power. In the name of compassion, they practice a vicious brand of gotcha politics. Under the banner of tolerance, they brook no dissent and cancel, annihilate, and crush anyone who refuses to submit to the insanity-inducing navel-gazing required to calibrate the appropriate level of guilt for this week's interlocking oppressions. And by the way, when they talk about hate speech, that is not really what they mean. They are objecting to heresy speech. They object to blasphemy. It is a very um, religious orientation and sensibility, uh, but in fact, it is a religion without God, without forgiveness, without reconciliation, without redemption, okay? This is not just a misunderstanding. The woke elite subscribe to a theory that attacks the very foundations of the classical liberal order, including equality, legal reasoning, the rule of law, rationalism, and the metaphysics of constitutional law. The principles undergirding Western civilization are dismissed as social constructs designed to legitimate white supremacy. The goal of the woke supremacy abetted by BLM and Antifa, the academy and the media, is the destruction, though they will call it the transformation, of the American founding and ultimately the American ideal. And they are serious as a heart attack. They have already succeeded in transforming a significant part of the nation's creed. America is no longer a country where ideas control violence. It has become a country where violence controls ideas. 
it is difficult to conceive of a result more antithetical to our constitutional ethic. Ravel offers a stern warning we should heed. He says, we cannot compromise with a system, one of whose objectives is our destruction, but must know how to, to distinguish between respect, which should not be uncritical, and servility in the face of systems whose internal logic implies the debasement or annihilation of our own. As he explains, you can make deals with the interests of others, but not their prejudices. If you give ground, you will get not gratitude, but more hatred for not having given all. And if you give all, they cannot be grateful because morally, you no longer exist. As Calvin Coolidge explained in a wonderful speech given in 1926 to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, most of those who clamor for reform are, he says, sincere but ill-informed. Of course, he never met the Wokarati. He might alter his view. <laughs> but he thought the underpinnings of American constitutionalism could be found in the texts, the sermons, and the writings of early colonial ministers who were instructing their congregations. Thus, he said, they preached equality because they believed in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. They justified freedom by the text that we are all created in the divine image, all partakers of the divine spirit. He concludes, the things of the spirit come first and warns that if we hope to maintain the legacy bequeathed to us, we must be like-minded. Man does not live by bread alone. Humanity survives if material wants are met, but humankind thrives only by recognizing the transcendent. Then our words have power and our symbols are potent. When warrior virtues like honor and valor and sacrifice still have meaning, when courage still makes us cry, in the end, we will have as bad a society as we are willing to endure, as good a society as we are willing to work to achieve. That work will be done in our homes, our families, our friendships, and our relationships with other people as individuals and not as classes or cardboard cutouts. Government, when properly limited, can assist us, but it can never substitute for individual responsibility, accountability, and energy. Most of all, it can never substitute for faith. I usually cite Oliver Wendell Holmes only to disagree with him. But Grant Gilmore attributes a paraphrase to Holmes with which I strongly agree. He said, law reflects, but in no sense determines the moral worth of society. The values of a reasonably just society will reflect themselves in a reasonably just law. The better the society, the less law there will be. In heaven, there will be no law, and the lion will lie down with the lamb. The values of an unjust society will reflect themselves in unjust law. The worse the society, the more law there will be. In hell, there will be nothing but law, and due process will be meticulously observed. <laughs> the desire to have government as the answer to all difficulties is understandable, but the Supreme Court cannot be the source of our salvation. It has all too often been part of the problem. Government is not the all-purpose lifeline that can bail us out of what ails us, Faith in Almighty God is, in addition, and this is a critical point, the relentless conformity and stunted spirit that result from efficient, encompassing government does irredeemable things to our humanity. And the difficulty of living in a society where we are dealing with incompetence, uh, inefficiency, intimidation, and bullying does irredeemable things to our sanity. I tend to agree with T.S. Eliot that the only hopeful course for a society that would thrive and continue its creative activity in the arts of civilization lies in the recognition and celebration of our Judeo-Christian roots. He says that prospect involves at least inconvenience and discomfort. But here as hereafter, the alternative to hell is purgatory. We really have no choice. We are in the throes of a woke revolution, an attempt to impose a top-down tyranny 
of the self-interested narcissistic minority committed to warping not just state power, but all institutions to serve <coughs> private interests, not only indifferent to, but boastfully dismissive of the notion of the common good. The only appropriate response is a bottom-up resistance to the selfless, courage of the selfless, courageous, ordinary citizens determined to act in support of the common good. Whether this bottom-up resistance begins here in DC is unclear. But what is certain is that for the resistance to succeed, it must, like the Marxist assault against our constitutional republic, be all-encompassing. Congress may not be the leader of our effort, but it too will need to be redeemed. Thank you. We have a few minutes uh, for questions. Uh, please, please raise your hand and make yourself known. Thank you very much. That was. Uh oh. Well, then I definitely shouldn't publish it. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, you mentioned Mike Gilman, God rest his soul, um, with regard to the sort of green light that the court has given to pornography. Mm -hmm. um, I know that a lot of talk about free speech today uh, and you know, in general about how to sort of solve the problem. Um, I also thought, Prescient, your, your, your comment that faith in an almighty God is important and I think of the beatitude, blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God. That is to say that the court has actually made it hard for people to see God uh, with that fleshly gate open. Uh, I'm curious, do you see a future for the court in, in uh, this court and, and onward doing more? And, and what, where, what do you, where do you see the court moving forward in, in trying yeah. to put that genie back in the bottle? Well, I, I want to be uh, helpful. And, uh, you know, they did do some things in this last term that uh, I, I guess it was time to expect it, but I wasn't sure. Um, and one of the things that Mike talks about is the, uh, you know, incorporating these notions, you know, of um, radical autonomy, you know, into the Constitution. And one of the worst of those was that mystery of life passage from uh, Casey, right? And so Dobbs put that to rest. We don't have to quote that anymore. <laughs> um, and so they may get around to, um, I, I mean, they seem to be indicating that they're going to deeply rethink a lot of things that um, you know that that have happened. The the the, um, uh, the oral argument in uh, the Harvard uh, um, UNC case was five hours, right? And they're usually thirty minutes. So that tells me that they're thinking to do you know a deep dive into that. So they are going back and looking at some you know, sort of sacred cows. Um, and I don't think if they're really serious about originalism um, that it would be beyond the pale for them to go back and look at um, what freedom of speech was really about, right? Uh, this, I, because, because they've done it backwards, right? And they've, they've really constrained political speech and religious speech and, you know, uh, given the green light to, to the, the thing that I'm sure the founders didn't have in mind. So, you know, <laughs> um, I, I'm hopeful, right? Um, I, have, I haven't seen that case. I don't think it's before the court, um, you know, this term. But um, people are getting smarter, I think, about shaping cases uh, to, to bring certain things to the fore. Um, and, you know, in, in the defense of courts, we only respond to what the litigants bring to us. So if the litigants do a better job of shaping um, those, uh, those cases so that, so that the court is looking at the right thing, right, when it's considering, it's possible. Now, the way that we think about originalism at the moment um, is very you know, limited on neutral principles, and I don't think it can ever get us where this group would like us to go. But it might get better. 
We have time for one more question. Jeff Clark. So Judge Brown, uh, is it time for you know, an attempt at a jurisprudence that includes natural rights and abandons positivism in some way, or is that a fever dream? <laughs> So I, I think it was time long ago, but the problem I have is um, uh, trying to articulate what that would be. I, I mean, people are, are, are correct to feel uh, that however we try to do this, to some extent, um, judges will be in the position of being able to substitute their judgment. Right? So I think the problem is trying to find um, how we, I mean, I think there's a way to do it, but, but I also think, and this is kind of what I was referring to, uh, I think there's a way to do it, but I think the reason that it wasn't hard in the beginning uh, for judges to channel kind of, you know, the founders' sensibility is because that's where they were, right? You know, that's where they lived, and everybody had that same sort of understanding of the world. We are now dealing with two very different worldviews, right? Um, and part of the problem is that the judges, uh, I used to have this uh, little joke that I would use in, in speeches, and it, it's, it, it's a little story, and it says, you know, two young fish are swimming through the ocean early in the morning, just having a good time, and an old fish comes by. He's moving kind of slow, and he says, Hey, fellas, how's the water? And he swims on. And the young fish swim on a little ways, and then one of us and the other, he says, what's water? <laughs> you know? This is what's going on, right? I mean, the, the, there, are, there are conservative judges who are channeling progressivism because they're trying to do the right thing, right? So it's, uh, I, I mean, it's difficult I mean, in, a, in a way. We can't go home again. Um, and so the question is, um, you know, can we reanimate something of that, of that sensibility? We had a whole lot of people talking about natural rights and natural law. That is clearly the telos and ethos of our Constitution. Um, but how do we, um, you know, how, how do we incorporate that? Uh, in a world which rejects all of that. So I, I think that's the big problem. Judge Brown, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's give him another round of applause. This, this concludes uh, our conference for the day. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you to the, our co-sponsors. To all of our panelists, we hope to stay in touch with you guys and uh, keep a lookout for future events. Thanks a lot.